What up denizens of the Intima webs? I'm technically Dave. And I'm Jacob. And today we're going to be tweaking the nuts off our favourite gaming CPU of the moment, the Ryzen 5 1600X. We're going to see how fast we can get it going and whether or not you need water cooling to get it going that fast. That's right, we're overclocking Ryzen. Boom. We're six months on from the Ryzen launch, so the platform should be at its most stable. So let's see how the 1600X fares with overclocking. Yeah, so first off, we're going to um, see what we can do with AMD's best Ryzen using the Wraith Max cooler. Yeah, the Wraith Max cooler launched in the US a couple of weeks ago for $60, but it sold out immediately, so you're not going to be able to find one. Yeah, it's AMD's top chip chiller at the moment. Um, it's got a TDP rating of 140 watts, so it's, it's able to cool that much energy. And it's got this lovely LED ring on top too. Which is very nice. Uh, the 1800X, which is the top Ryzen chip, has a TDP of 95 watts, so it should be able to give a little bit of overclocking headroom for that. Um, but just for being impartial, there are quite a few other air coolers which will do the job just as well. Yeah, so like I mean, the likes of Cooler Master and NMAX have got some slightly cheaper ones which will still do the job. Um, but before we go any further, we should probably do the super serious warning thing though. Yeah, overclocking will make you look really, really cool. It totally will. But it can be dangerous at times if you push it a bit too far and PC Games then takes no responsibility for any damage that you might run into if you follow all the steps in this video. Yeah. But really, the sort of overclocking that us simpletons are going to be doing today is about as dangerous to the health of your CPU as tickling it with a particularly non-conductive feather. So, let's see what we can do. So before we go any further, it's probably best to figure out how your machine's performing at the moment. So let's do a quick bit of benchmarking. So grab hardware monitor to figure out how quickly your CPU is running and how toasty it gets too. Cinebench R15 is a free CPU testing application that will allow you to test both the single and multi-threaded performance of your processor, so go and download that. We're also going to use 3 d Mark's Time Spy test, as that will give us an overall as well as a CPU-specific index score. Then we're also going to use Civilization VI, a game which loves good processors, to test what sort of performance boost our tweaking has delivered. So now you know the base performance of your processor, it's time to get it going that little bit further. Yeah, we're using a sexy MSI X370 board that wants to do all the hard work for you, and uh, we're going to see how far this little hardware knob on it can yeah. push it. So the manual says that if we turn this up to 11, yes, 11, um, we can get 4.3 gigahertz on the 6-core chip. So what happens when we turn it up to 11? Let's find out. With the machine turned off, we have to push the dial up to 11 and reboot. The board will automatically set up the CPU configuration when we restart. So we're into Windows now, and let's see what it's trying to do. The manual says that this setting should deliver 4.3 GHz, but that's pretty optimistic with the Ryzen Silicon, so the 4.1 GHz we're seeing here is a little bit more realistic, but only a little. So let's see how stately it is. Right, so not very. So let's dial it back a little. Right, now we're rebooting into Windows at 4.05 GHz, and it seems a bit more stable. But a quick check of CPU Z shows that in order to get there, MSI have upped the CPU voltage to 1.480 volts. AMD themselves have said that voltages up to 1.45 volts are sustainable, but running at that level or above will affect the lifespan of your CPU. Personally, we wouldn't recommend you stick to that voltage as a standard. So it's all very well letting your motherboard do all the heavy lifting for you, uh, but if you really want to get the most out of your chip, it's worth doing the hard work yourself. Yeah, you can't go through the usual BIOS shenanigans or the Windows software, but uh, AMD have also released their Ryzen Master utility, which is pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, um, me, well, I'm more of an old school BIOS kind of guy. Yeah, Ryzen loves speedy memory, and since the memory compatibility update, AM4 now supports a lot faster speeds. Yeah, so that's where we're going to start. So the first thing you have to do is make sure you've got the memory running at its correct rated speed. You do that using the XMP, or here, AXMP settings. Then it's all about using the multiplier settings to get the right CPU frequency. The base clock is 100 megahertz for the processor, and the multiplier is what gives you the final clock speed. So if you whack it up to time 60, and boom, you've got six gigahertz. Well, actually no, we've got to take things a little bit slower than that. The standard single core frequency of the 1600X is 4 GHz, so we ought to be able to hit that easily. But it wasn't so easy at launch, so let's see if things have improved over the last six months. We'll start at 3.9 GHz for our all core speed and see how that goes. Okay, so when you're back in Windows, boot up Hardware Monitor and check the temps and that the overclocking frequency has stuck. Uh, now we can run Cinebench in multi-threaded mode a couple of times to test stability. Okay, so that's pretty stable, but we don't want to stop there. So we've booted into 4 GHz, and that seems stable, but as soon as we start to stress it with Cinebench, then it starts to fall over. 
So this is the point where it looks like the silicon can't take any more. But you can have a play around with the voltages if you're feeling brave. Now be careful here because this can be where there's a greater chance of bricking your chips. The MSI board here has been automatically upping the CPU voltage in line with our overclock to try and maintain stability. We can take it a little bit further. We're only going to push it up a little bit more because it can also bump up the temperatures a pretty hefty amount too. Unlike the automatic overclocking of MSI, we're going to draw the line at 1.4 volts. As we said, any higher than that and you're going to run the risk of long-term damage. Okay, so we've managed to hit 4 GHz with air cooling and that seems pretty stable with the higher voltages. So what can we do with water cooling? Is that going to give us any more performance? So let's see. So that's how far we managed to get with some epoxy fan, but what happens when we start adding water into the mix? Okay, so these are closed loop coolers, meaning they're sealed with the coolant inside, pre-installed. Um, the only difference is they're a little bit more pricey than your standard air coolers, especially for the larger ones like this 214mm one. Yeah, water cooling has the potential to offer better cooling performance, though that doesn't necessarily mean better peak temps. Um, you could see that the chip might get back to uh, cooler temperatures quicker than with standard air cooling. Okay, so we'll start with the air cooled frequency that we managed to hit before and see what we can do from there. Okay, we're setting the bias to the last stable configuration we hit with the Wraith Max air cooler. And that's completely stable, so let's see if we can push it a little bit further. So we're pushing up to 4.1 GHz now using a times 41 multiplier. And we're going to use the same 1.4 volts to see if we can get that stable. Okay, so running Cinebench here and that's crashed out, so we're going to have to dial it back a little bit. So even water cooling isn't going to help us hit 4.1 GHz without lots more voltage, but we can at least get it up to 4.05 GHz. Yeah, that extra 50 MHz doesn't exactly sound worth it, does it? So water cooling hasn't offered us much of a benefit over air cooling. Now, but what it has done is made things a bit quieter. Um, what we've got here is the machine running at absolute full chat. So the CPU's maxed out, all cores going at full 100% load. And this is what it sounds like with the air cooler. So if I shut up for a second, you'll hear. So we're down at about 48 decibels, which is really, really quiet for a cooler, especially one that's running at full speed. And this is what an air cooler sounds like. So that's about as far as we can push the 1600X with our limited skills, but what does it mean in terms of the final performance? Okay, so let's check. In Cinebench, we're about 12% faster in the multi-threaded speed and 9% quicker in terms of the 1600X's single-threaded performance. Now that's kind of the key metric for gaming speeds. And in 3D Mark's time spy test, our CPU score has gone up by nearly 13%. And finally, with our Civilization 6 AI test, the time it takes for a turn to complete with the computer, that's around 13% quicker with our lovely new overclock chip. And all that was for free. Bargain. So water cooling might not necessarily have made things quicker or cooler when it comes to the 1600X, but it's definitely made things quieter when we're overclocking. Yeah, six months down the line, Ryzen may be far more stable, but we're still not getting that much more out of the silicon than we did at launch. Um, but the 6-core 12-thread 1600X is still our BFF when it comes to gaming CPUs. Um, there's nothing at the moment that can come close to the bang for buck you get from AMD's best Ryzen. Yeah, so if you uh, liked what you've seen, and even if you haven't, then give us the old like and subscribe, check uh, out all the rest of the content on the YouTube channel, and more on the website. Absolutely, fantastic. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you.